Up next, we're going to have Craig Platt from GE, who we'll talk about how the 3D Experience platform is part of an agile transformation at GE and speed their time to value. But first, to introduce this concept, uh, we have a video. So let's play the video. The world is changing. New technologies are pushing the boundaries of the possible. People everywhere want cleaner and cheaper ways to manage energy use. They want to work smarter and be more productive. Yet inefficiency and waste still surround us. That's why Current exists. We're a new kind of startup powered by the resources of GE. A unique blend of GE's proud energy heritage and promising digital future. A business that believes partnerships fuel progress and sees products as the foundation of outcomes. Our mission is to make our customers more efficient and productive than ever before. It's an idea called the intelligent environment, and it starts with energy. Applying the world's most advanced lighting and solar technologies to help customers save money and predict costs. But it extends beyond energy into digital networks that shed light on the unseen inefficiency living all around us. We capture value hiding in the walls, floors, and ceilings of almost every type of building imaginable. Current is the digital engine for intelligent environments. Our people are trailblazers, and our style is scrappy. We move fast, learn quickly, and pivot. Working hand-in-hand -hand with our partners, we deliver the best possible outcomes for our customers. Because at the end of the day, our customers are people just like us. People who see a better way. People who embrace the future. We energize people to see the unseen, revealing the potential of their environment. Great, so without further ado, let me welcome to the stage Craig Platt, Vice President, Technical Product Management, Digital Technology at GE. And he's got his own theme music. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> so good morning. A couple of key themes are going on here. I've been in information technology, now digital technology, since 1978. So I've been around for 40 years in this environment. And I guess some of you are thinking, wow, he must have started when he was eight. Some of you are probably thinking I should have been in the video that Dean showed with the old mainframes. But I'm here to talk to you about choices that you make, and they're very similar to everything that we just heard. What happens when the government across the world outlaws your products? That your inefficient light sources can no longer be manufactured and sold across the world. What do you do when you wake up in that world? There's a whole group of new competitors that started in their garages that were not capital intensive because it was all about chips and digital technology to generate light. So you have to reinvent yourself. And that's what we did. We took a 100 plus year old business, GE Lighting, and created a new startup within it, current powered by GE. And so when we walk around and we look at lights, we don't see lights. As I explained it to uh, everybody at dinner yesterday, I see infrastructure. I see opportunities to create digital environments to help drive customer outcomes, right? So if we're sitting in this room, it can count the number of people, can monitor their temperature, uh, it can alert you to uh, differences in, 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 in uh, carbon monoxide, if anything happens like that. But it also, if I'm walking in a store, it can tell the store owner how much time I spent in front of a particular shelf. And then connecting that to point of sale data to figure out if that product is moving fast enough. So we look at it as a digital environment, intelligent environment. And, and what happens then is we open up that infrastructure, that operating model, to other suppliers to build applications that use this infrastructure that we built. So what was the problem with that? Well, as you can see, uh, there was a great evolution going on at uh, Dassault, 
But unfortunately, here's where we were. We were way back on Matrix One platform. Never upgraded since I put it in almost 18 to 20 years ago. So we were on a burning platform. Not only that, we were in a burning data center. All of our uh, infrastructure was combined with GE appliances, which we sold a couple years. So we were on the clock to exit. So to talk about what the previous speakers talked about, Bernard and Dean, we had a choice to make, right? You can go pick up the old servers and put them in a truck, because literally you're going to have to do that, and drive them from Louisville to Cincinnati. It's not far. You could do that, because we were afraid if you tried to port them and put them on new servers, they would never work. So what were we going to do? Dark ages? Renaissance. We chose Renaissance. We decided to jump from that 1999 version of Matrix One uh, PLM to 3D. And we had to do it in a short period of time, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So how did we do it? We heard people talk about silos within businesses, right? We had to create a shared consciousness. Everybody focused on what we are trying to do understanding that there were risks associated with it and managing it. And then the concept of FIRE. FIRE is a book by uh, uh, Dan Ward, and it stands for Fast, Inexpensive, Restrained, But Elegant. So it doesn't mean that you're getting something that's cheap and dirty that's not effective. It is saying that you can do these things if you are focused and restraining yourself on where you're going, and then you can create an elegant solution to get you there. So that was a big part of us. And we actually talked about this last night at dinner, trust. And these guys never even saw my presentation, and it's all about trust, and that's how the journey went. We leveraged the intellect of our complete enterprise. In GE, the infrastructure team is horizontal. So we had our GE core tech team. First call I made when we knew that we were going to try to do this. And we were starting in August. And they were turning off the data center in June. And we had 1,300 users across four continents. And oh, by the way, my team, where you see uh, uh, GE team, five people were on my digital thread team focused on product management and engineering. So suffice to say, we needed help. First person I called, James Olander, GE Power, one of the biggest users of Dassault software. And I said, I need your help. So we put the infrastructure team together with GE Power, and they created platform as a service for us. Infrastructure spun up the software, and then James' team jumped in and installed, well, they spun up the hardware. James' team jumped in and installed the software. And then we partnered with Sajeti, Cap Gemini now, uh, to build out the configurations. And it was a team of teams. And I could tell you this if I took the estimates that everybody gave me in the beginning, this thing was going to take us 18 to 24 months. We had to make a decision. Dark ages. Renaissance. We convinced the business to go Renaissance, and we set some dates, some timetables that says, well, if we have to pivot, we'll know by this date. Probably two months into the project, it was too late to pivot, but they didn't need to know all of that, okay? All of these teams worked not only vertically, but they worked horizontally to get this solution in for us. And we did this using Agile. Now, there were probably 100 plus configurations that we did on the current side of the business and another 100 on the GE lighting side, which is the consumer side. And what we said was we, we did a lot of studying and we looked at our products and our platforms and we looked for synergy in them and we organized them into sprints. And then what we said is here's the five modules that we're implementing and what are the things that we need to do? What are the number of use cases? Uh, what are the attributes that are needed? Uh, what are the things that need to be configured from a user 
interface perspective. And the good news is this, we also had a little space for customizations. We had three development teams. So every time we ran a sprint, there was a complete team of teams, a pod, that had an architect, lead programmer, uh, the, the configuration people, three complete teams. The first two were to keep the sprints organized because what I learned across 40 years, if you think you have one development team and you're going fast and they're gonna be in a room with your users and then you think they're gonna have time to develop something before the next group comes in, it doesn't work that way. So we created independent pods across Sajeti, across GE Power, across all of those team of teams. And every time we finished uh, a sprint, getting the use case stories, two weeks later, the sprint would take two weeks. Two weeks later, we could give team members a demo of the application. How did this happen? Well, one thing is a testament to the quality of the software, because a lot of it had to be out of the box. I did leave some room for customization, but you had to sit down with me and prove to me why you needed that customization. And we kept them out of the end. So what you see right here is sprint number two. And what it's telling you is, since it was a sprint, that there's work left over from sprint one that you needed to do, but here's 15 configurations that you need and the customizations, and here's the defects left over, and all the things you have to fit. And all we did was rinse and repeat that process. Now, the hope and the bet was this. After you go through a couple of sprints, the number of customizations get very, very small. Right? And that happened. Most things were very, very configurable. And we changed our whole data model. So we would go and, and rinse the data off the old system and connect it in different ways to add more value across the enterprise. The system that we were using was document oriented. Here's my document and want some attributes. So everything was trapped in that document. It wasn't linked for product management. Uh, it wasn't linked for a supply chain. It was really a document management system that the engineering team used. We opened the enterprise with this. We brought in not just uh, the people who were our product managers, we brought in users, a lot of different ways of looking at this, and then we ran these cycles three times. We started in September with some pre-work, and then we moved forward uh, with the software. Now, I'd love to tell you that everything went exactly as planned, but we know that doesn't happen, particularly when you're doing a renaissance, right? Because you're trying something new. You're taking a bigger step. You're taking risk. You're focused, but you still know that you're taking risk. So what happened? So came in, uh, John Botzell and Cliff Stockley, and they came in and they gave us this demo that we didn't recognize. And there was this tool called a dashboard that had been created by one of the software developers for a customer. And I said, gotta have the dashboard because it brought everything together. You know, if you were doing project management, bomb management, change, whatever you were doing, this dashboard was where you started. I said, gotta have it. They said, no problem, just like any great supplier, right? No problem. We're going to have version 16X, and we're going to integrate the dashboard into it, okay? I had told the business we are going to make a go, no go decision in mid-October. In September, the CEO came back to me and said, we have some, some problems, but we have options for you. The dashboard technically cannot work with 2016 software. And we could keep trying to force it and make it work, and you're going to have a piece of software that no other customer is running. So you're going to be on an island by yourself. Or you can put in this version, not get all the productivity, we'll come back later. Or I can't even remember option number three. But there were three options. You know what option I chose? Number four. <laughs> they were like, Craig, what's option number four? I said, you're telling me the 2017 software is going to be available commercially 
in early November, November the 7th, right? I said, okay, I have a go, no go decision, middle of October, but I can dance through that. I'll push it out to the end. But if your software is gonna be commercially available on November 7th, then by mid to late November, October, you gotta be close. I'll take the risk. Well, we have to go talk to people. And Dassault agreed, and on October 25th, we got an early release of 2017 software. Now, they asked me to tell you, since a lot of you are customers in here, that that does not happen a lot, <laughs> okay? So if you're getting ready to call and say, hey, the Renaissance stuff, uh, <laughs> give me that with no magic tomorrow, they asked me to tell you it doesn't really happen that way. But that was our journey together. That's why trust was critical, right? I need it, it's gonna be solid, we'll bet on it. Because by that time, it was gonna be time to go back up the trucks and go to Louisville and pick up the old servers and drive them up to, uh, uh, up to Cincinnati. Uh, you, you can see how we progressed, right? Once we got the version of software, uh, we, in October, we tested it. We got an updated version in late November. We got it on our servers in December. Meantime, we started our sprints. We started configuring it for how things, uh, how the product lines needed to use it. And we launched April 2nd. We got software November 7th. We launched April 2nd. That's a lot of great work by a lot of great teams working together. And that is the only way that these types of things happen. You have to partner across your whole uh, enterprise to find the intellect, to find the right great thinkers to make things happen. They have to be able to see lights not as things that keep you out of the dark, but as infrastructure for the future. Because now there's software in there, there's chips in there, there's controls and all of that. And we needed a new operating model to deliver outcomes to our customers. I was asked yesterday, um, I think by Charles, asked me, well, who's your competitors? And he named a couple of the traditional lighting competitors. No, everything that you just saw tells you your competitor could be in the garage right now with an idea. She might go and get online. She might be in the marketplace, design this thing, have somebody else build it, and she has not even left home. That's who we're competing with. And that's today, and that's real, and that's the fight that we're going on. So what do we need to have? First of all, we had to get out of the burning Matrix One platform, and we did it. We had reduced our cycle time on the listing process. It used to be across all these systems by 67%. When I talk about horizontal productivity, that's the digital thread, right? Product management, design, supply chain, down to the shop floor, and we capture all that data in our Predix environment. So we have a digital twin of what you were thinking about as a light bulb. It's not. It's your operating model. It's your new infrastructure systems. And we capture all of that data. What's next? We're extending out to the service side of our business now. We didn't need service before. If you had an incandescent bulb, we knew it was going to burn out in a year. We just waited for you to come back to the store. <laughs> now it's infrastructure. We care about the firmware, the software, what version of Bluetooth uh, is in there, what the network node uh, looks like, and it's lasting 17 to 20 years. Now we have a server side of our business, right? Whole new operating model. So it has been a great journey. Thank you for allowing me to speak here. I've got two minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock to hand back to the next presenter. Thank you. <laughs>